This image gently lecture is called Using Exposure Indicators to Improve Pediatric Digital Radiography. This lecture is part of a series of lectures for Image Gently's Back to Basics campaign. Image Gently is considered to be part of the Alliance for Radiation Safety and Pediatric Imaging. Overall, Image Gently is considered to be an education, awareness, and advocacy campaign. It's Overall, Image Gently is considered to be an education, awareness, and advocacy campaign with the overarching goal to improve radiation protection for children worldwide. Image Gently has a large influence within the medical imaging community. And while some of these figures are a little bit aged, Image Gently has greater than 70 healthcare organizations or agencies that have bought into that movement, and greater than 800,000 radiologists, radiologic technologists, and medical physicists have pledged to the imaging campaign worldwide. You, as students, can also pledge to this campaign, um, and I certainly encourage you to do so um, to demonstrate your commitment to um, continuing to educate yourself on safe radiation protection practices when using um, X-ray or ionizing radiation for children. Additionally, the Image Gently Alliance seeks to raise awareness in the imaging community of the need to continuously evaluate um, radiation dose levels um, that are being used when imaging children. As you know, children are more sensitive to the potential deleterious effects of radiation, so we have to utilize um, radiation responsively um, in all populations, but um, more so even in pediatric uh, populations. So the Alliance seeks to uh, really to change clinical practice, and a lot of that starts with us as technologists. You think, you know, who's responsible for um, controlling the amount of dose um, that's being delivered to our patients? You know, that ultimately it falls in our hands to make sure that we're using appropriate techniques um, to make sure that we're immobilizing properly, to make sure that we're um, utilizing the shortest times to reduce the potential for motion and the potential for repeats, and we're using sound positioning guidelines. Um, all of those things you know, take in, or should be taken into account. This particular lecture just focuses on exposure indicators, but there are other lectures that are available that focus on other topics such as immobilization. So I do encourage you to also um, view some of those resources, some of the presentations that are also available on the Image Gently website. In today's lecture, we're really going to focus on digital radiography technology. Digital radiography has become the norm in hospitals within the United States. And really, you think about the ability to immediately view images, post-process, and transmit images system-wide are really clear, distinct advantages of this technology. But yet, these technical advances um, have really kind of created challenges within the radiology community, including the need to re-educate um, the workforce to make sure that we are doing everything that we can to prevent unnecessary radiation exposure to pediatric patients. This educational process is even more important in children we're maintaining diagnostic imaging quality at a properly managed dose is critical for patient care. Thinking that um, children are more sensitive than adults to the potential effects of ionizing radiation, particular attention really needs to be placed on technique and its relationship to patient dose. So this PowerPoint is going to emphasize the need uh, for attention to the basics of radiography and the importance of a standard approach in pediatric digital radiography. Some of the major objectives are listed here, including reviewing some of the basic principles of imaging, and then to break down some of the um, uh, differences between screen film radiography and digital radiography. While screen film radiography is no longer um, the norm or the, or the standard and computed radiography, CR, is also quickly going away, um, some principles, especially those that are left from screen film radiography, are still currently used um, in um, digital radiography. Some are appropriate and some are inappropriate, and hopefully um, this lecture helps to clarify some of those that are appropriate and some things that may need to change. Overall, we're going to seek to um, describe the meaning of exposure indicators and to break down the IEC exposure terminology standard. So this um, uh, standard is um, utilized in all new digital radiography equipment, and some um, systems have been 
um, adapted uh, to make sure that they incorporate the IEC standard, but not all systems. So um, nonetheless, you know, this system is something that you're going to need to become familiar with. So hopefully by the end of the lecture, you're able to um, not only understand that, but understand how this uh, system and terminology can also be used in the quality assurance process. Keep in mind that the basics of radiology are just as important today as they were in the past. Uh, standard approach to pediatric radiography requires currently the use of calipers and technique charts. And you think, well, um, you think reflect on clinical practice, calipers are rarely used. But in order for us to um, set appropriate manual techniques, um, those that do not use AEC, um, we need to really get an accurate understanding of what is that true part thickness and to be able to manipulate our techniques based on that. Technique charts are also um, more difficult um, to locate in digital radiography departments. And it's, it's truly unfortunate because techniques today are much lower than they were in um, screen film radiography uh, the days of screen film radiography. So at times, technologists have continued to apply those same types of techniques and the same types of standards uh, for manipulating those techniques when not, they don't always hold true in today's, um, in today's uh, processes. So the other types of things that you need to um, become aware of is that anatomically programmed radiography or APR, which is essentially the pre-programmed or preset um, techniques that are provided by manufacturers, they may not always be appropriate with ch for children. When you look at your control panel, um, sometimes you have two, two buttons, one for an adult, one for a pediatric. Sometimes you'll have three buttons where it's you can manipulate your preset, you know, big patient, medium-sized patient, small patient. Uh, but, you know, when you think about children, you know, not all children are, you know, the same size. Not all, you know, one size does not necessarily fit all. And we should be st making sure that we use a standard approach to make sure that we come up with a reproducible uh, method um, to uh, setting our techniques once again. And that usually is going to involve the development of a technique chart. And it's suggested that these are either printed or um, programmed into the um, unit's APR so they're easily adjusted. So some of those may be inappropriate. They may be set too high by default. So we can't really rely on what's in there unless um, you've worked with a combination of your medical physicist and your radiologist to determine um, the acceptable amount of model for each given uh, projection. When I say model, I mean uh, the graininess um, of uh, um, an image and what's acceptable. Once you determine, okay, this level of graininess or model um, is still okay for um, diagnostic quality, essentially that becomes your bottom level. Um, anything less than that is going to be considered to be underexposed. And then you work up from, from that to consider you know, what is then optimal and what would then be considered overexposed as well. Now this chart further um, alludes to some of those points that I just mentioned to make sure that we're um, measuring the body parts appropriately to determine part thickness. Uh, but other actions to ensure optimal um, techniques are just to make sure that we position the patient properly the first time, avoiding of repeats, um, to make sure that we're using grids effectively. So um, pediatric patients often are not going to need grids, including for you know chest and abdominal x-rays. So just kind of keep that in mind that um, parts less than 10 to 12 centimeters thick certainly are not going to need a grid. Another thing to think about is pre-exposure collimation. So um, in today's rapid um, post-processing reproducibility world, um, sometimes shuttering or post-processing or post-collimation um, can be used. Well, that of course doesn't protect our patients. It also creates more scatter, so the image quality isn't as, uh, as sound. So um, we obviously don't want to expose tissue that doesn't need to be exposed. So when we can, um, make sure you collimate effectively, um, thinking about the specific anatomy that's needed um, for um, that particular exam.
Additionally, shield, shield something. You know, it doesn't always have to be the gonads. It could certainly be the breast. It could be the thyroid. It can be any radiosensitive part. Maybe that's uh, perhaps, you know, the um, small intestine. Maybe that's the femoral head. So um, a shield should be used on every patient, regardless if you're shielding the gonads. So just kind of keep that idea in mind. Um, additionally, um, AEC may be inappropriate at times for pediatric patients. We'll get into that um, here in a second so you can see an example of, of when it would be inappropriate. And when AEC or automatic exposure control is considered to be um, inappropriate, that means we need to set a manual technique. And when we set a manual technique, that means we need to know that, um, that child's thickness to make sure that we can child size that technique appropriately for that individual patient. And finally, we need to then review the exposure indicators and make sure that we're assessing for um, appropriate image quality as, as well. So those exposure indicators, while they're not going to um, reduce exposure on that particular patient, hopefully you're using those effectively to um, uh, self-check yourself to make sure that the techniques that you are selecting are most appropriate. As promised, here is an example of AEC and um, when it's not appropriate. So as we look at this particular image um, by um, Gasky et al., you can see that this particular patient, um, mannequin in this case, um, you can see where those AEC chambers are located here and here. Um, so what's going to really happen is that those chambers are going to become uh, directly exposed. So what will happen is that um, you'll have direct transmission, which means that it's going to get its reading too early. It's going to assume that it's, it's received enough radiation, it'll terminate the exposure, and what can result at um, because of that is an image that's uh, grossly underexposed, which it can result in model, and then subsequently you may um, um, have to repeat that image. So um, lessening repeat certainly is a way to reduce and control um, ionizing radiation exposures. So this may necessitate the need for manual pediatric specific techniques um, in this particular case. Um, additionally, um, there is an example about collimation. So when we look at this particular example, you can see how leaving a field open, um, wider in this case, you can see where the humerus is on both sides. What that's going to do is it's going to create more grays, more scatter. Um, and obviously this image here is not as superior as this image here. So just kind of keep that um, concept in mind is that you know while you can go back and, and trim, the importance of collimation cannot be underestimated, not only for image quality, but now for patient exposure. So here in this case, we're exposing the whole humerus. Here in this case, not, not as much. And even here, we can still continue to um, cone down um, to just um, the uh, structures um, needed for this particular chest exam. So looking from the apices through the costophrenic angles in this case. The next important concept to address are really some of the differences that surround uh, screen film radiography versus digital radiography. And as I uh, talk about digital radiography really throughout this presentation, I'm going to use that term to simultaneously mean CR and DR. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind uh, throughout the rest of the presentation. When you look at traditional screen film systems, they use the overall optical density um, of that film as the exposure indicator. The final optical density of the film is ultimately related to the patient's exposure. Therefore, an image that is too light, like um, image A here, it's going to um, depict that. The amount of blackness um, is going to be readily, readily evident of, hey, that's underexposed. Um, vice versa, when you look at C, it's a darker image, and in this case, it, the film received more um, X-ray photons than it needed, and um, as a result, resulted in a overexposure or too dark of an image. B is considered to be that optimal image. So what really happens when you look, um, what the shape is here, let me zoom in a little bit here, is a histogram. And when you look at this in this case, the histogram is something that is provided in a um, digital, digital um, 
radiograph. So um, what really happens is that that histogram is placed on the straight line portion of this H and D curve. And in this case, um, optimal, when you look at that optimal exposure or image B um, here, that histogram is right on that straight line portion. So it's going to be ideal um, in the form of the, um, its, its contrast um, indicators in this particular um, scale. So what we're seeing here is something that looks very appropriate. Now when we look at that histogram for the overexposed, you can see, well, the center of it, you go to that center point, and it's at the top of that H and D curve. So it's, it's too far to the right, so it's not in its appropriate location, so we're not able to see that. The important thing to understand is that in digital radiography, those histograms really aren't there. Um, but what it's trying to do is, is setting up the next, the next slide so you can better understand that we cannot manipulate this. Essentially, the data is, is uh, set where, where it's at, and then um, we essentially you know, are stuck with that, that final project, product. So optical density of, the, uh, of a film is the exposure indicator. It's immediate feedback. Um, there's um, charts, there's experience that was used to um, set at proper exposure, exposure factors, and, and in the end, you have this nice visual representation of what that would look like on a screen film. However, that's really not the case in, with digital radiography. So digital radiography, which does include, again, CR and DR, was really um, introduced into clinical departments in the 1980s um, as a way to create you know, a digital image um, as opposed to an analog screen film. So the CR process um, and the DR process do differ, but in the end, so what it means is that we have the ability to post-process and the be ability to be able to manipulate that image. CR also is considered to have a large latitude. Um, specifically, that term exposure latitude means essentially the amount of uh, error that we can have. And we can have a large amount of error and still have a very acceptable um, image in terms of um, its, our ability to use it for diagnostic quality. So what that means is that if something is underexposed, we can use it. If something's overexposed, we can use it. So we, with these types of systems, have the ability to manipulate that data. And in this case, when we think back to that previous slide, where these histograms were not in the center of that straight line portion, in this case, what happens is that that H and D curve here just moves. It moves to where the data is, and it strives then to produce an image that is of optimal quality. So when you look at that, that center point here is right in the center point of that H and D curve. Same with the optimal exposure, right at the center. Same with the overexposure. So yes, you can see left or right, you can think, well, on this side, it's closer to um, on the x-axis here would be closer to underexposed in terms of the positioning of the histogram. And um, as we move to the right side over here, this is considered to be overexposed. So it's kind of plotted. So when you just look at it, you know, it's, it's, it's one, one you know, quadrant to another. You can think this is in the bottom left quadrant. This is in the bottom right quadrant. Um, you can see that nonetheless, wherever that's plotted, that H and D curve moves and allows us to now be able to um, visualize what appears, if we are just assessing that image, what appears to be of appropriate quality. So what this means is that um, images are very good and it allows us to be able to have things go unnoticed. Um, and what's even worse about digital radiography is the overexposed image here actually provides more diagnostic diagnostic detail. Um, it's clearer. It has less model. But sometimes it's not about you know the clearer or the less model. It's about our exposure to our patient, making sure we're optimizing that to be able to produce something that is of diagnostic quality um, for that patient to have a diagnosis. So it's not necessarily um, in today's world about having um, the most photons hit the image receptor. It's about having the least amount of photons hit that image receptor to make an acceptable exposure for that radiologist to be able to interpret. So the approach and determinations are completely different. 
But what the big point is, is that if we visually assess this, we have no ability to be able to recognize overexposure versus underexposure. The exception, if it's grossly underexposed, we can see a mo more modeled type of appearance, but that's the exception. Overexposures routinely go unnoticed, so that's why it's so important to make sure that we are um, utilizing our exposure indicators to our advantage to be able to um, actually assess whether our techniques and our approaches were effective and appropriate. So what I'm gonna introduce next is a term referred to as dynamic range. And dynamic range has to do with the ability of a detector to be able to um, take that information and to use it. Digital detectors are considered to have a linear response over um, the exposure ranges that we actually use. So for screen film, it's considered to have a limited di dynamic range. And for digital, it's considered to have a wide dynamic range. What this truly means is that it's capable of um, using that information, a very wide range of information, and still making an acceptable radiograph in the end. So because of that wide range, we can do that. Screen film has that limited range, meaning you need to be pretty spot on with your imaging technique to be able to produce a um, acceptable image. So it's very narrow, very limited range, because if we exceed that range, we're going to have a darker film or overexposed film. And if we don't use enough, we're going to have a light film. So very different process where digital, you know, it can use a wide range of techniques. The intent is that that is designed to reduce the amount of repeats, which the, reducing the amount of repeats reduces the amount of patient dose. The problem is when we have consistently have overexposed images, which as we, as you'll find is that sometimes something is grossly overexposed, two times overexposed, three times overexposed, four times overexposed. And when you think about that, you know, four times overexposed is equivalent to four radiographs or you know, I radiograph plus three repeats. So, you know, that's a ton of more exposure. And um, at times that can go unnoticed if we're not paying attention to our exposure indicators. This graphic just reiterates what I just mentioned. So the response range here on this curve um, is very limited. So that means that our exposure, so you can think about this, you know, use the x-axis to your advantage. So um, this is no exposure right at the corner, and then exposure increases as we go over our x-axis. So if our histogram were to be plotted here, it would be dark, you know, overexposed, you know, not in the appropriate response range. If our exposure is, you know, over here, it would be clear. We wouldn't have enough um, inf information to be able to um, process that or for the radiologist to make diagnostic decisions. So very limited range. It's This is kind of that red area is kind of that sweet spot. To reiterate this concept, think about this here. Um, so we have a standard chest x-ray. Um, and in this case, um, what's happening is, is that you can see that the mass is either doubled here or halved here. And you can see the big impact that uh, manipulating that mass has on um, the exposure. And when we think about mass, we think about quantity, we think about the total number um, of x-ray photons that are um, there. And in this case, you can see, okay, the density is, is clearly overexposed here. Um, and this one's too light, so not enough x-ray photons. And you can see where that would be then um, plotted respectfully um, in these particular areas. So when we look at this, you can say, okay, looking here, this one has to be the underexposed region. This has to be optimal in the straight line portion. And this has to be overexposed and very overexposed. Um, and the potential for that is, is certainly as possible. So you can see the differences then, you know, readily when we look back at these chest x-rays and say, okay, visually, we can be able to interpret that and understand, you know, what that does because of the limited dynamic range um, that we have to be very precise and accurate with our techniques. With digital radiography, again, the response is considered to be very wide. So it can use anything from um, down low, very underexposed, to something very overexposed until it hits that plateau. And that plateau is considered to be detector saturation up here. So um, no matter how much more um, 
technique you give, it's not going to do anything else. And essentially, at the, at the point of detector saturation, you do have um, the potential of noticing that visually. So um, it can be very dark because essentially you're having almost pure transmission. There's a lot of photons that are going through the, through the patient at, at that point more than um, what you need uh, to be able to produce something that's of sound diagnostic quality. But the response range uh, for a digital detector is considered to be um, from 100 micro to 100 millirinkin. Um, so giant, um, giant um, range there in, in, that, in that case. So um, that means it's going to be able to respond appropriately to uh, something that's underexposed, something that's optimally exposed, something that's overexposed, and still be able to use that information. Additionally, what I would like like you to see here is that this is considered to be uh, a linear response. So for the most part, it's purely linear until it exceeds that threshold, perhaps at 100 millirinkin um, over here. So as we look at this information here, and, and this will be reiterated on the coming slides as well, what you're able to see here visually um, at, for digital is quantum model, graininess or noise at grossly underexposed ranges. So at the very, very bottom, you may notice that it's underexposed. Up here for gross overexposure, which this particular um, radiograph, um, AP radiograph of the knee, is considered to be 10 times overexposed um, for this particular um, image. And in this case, it still looks pretty good. But when you think about 10 times, that's 10 radiograph, equivalent of 10 radiographs um, that were um, amount of radiation that was delivered for this particular projection. That's, that's a ton, um, but visually you can still make out that information, but you can start to see a little bit of saturation um, towards the edges. So um, once we get further up, you may see more saturation. So because of that wide range, what we need to do as technologists is to understand there are portions of this wide range that should be treated with the same type of mindset of screen film in that we should have a sweet spot in here for optimal exposure and understand that um, we have underexposure, the potential for gross underexposure, the potential for overexposure, and the potential for gross overexposure here. Visually, again, that would produce something that would look very, perhaps very good and very acceptable, but nonetheless, it's not optimal in terms of what the radiologist needs to make their decisions. Further reiterate that, um, the term that I mentioned, detector saturation, really would be um, beyond that. So if we were to extend this out, that plateau um, that would go out here, that would be where this uh, particular radiograph would be housed. So essentially the definition of um, detector saturation is excessive signals, um, excessive x-rays, excessive transmission is happening and it's degrading the overall image quality because the, the receptor is re just receiving so much photons that it can't take that information and reprocess it any different. So now I want you to take a close look at these images and, and really when, when you look at you know each of these, we, we can look at them close, we can look at them further away, it's pretty difficult to make a visual interpretation of technique. And this should be that one point that's really gonna drive home, we cannot make exposure appropriateness decisions based on visual appearance in digital imaging. Whether that's CR or DR, it's, it's, it's just purely inappropriate. Um, because when you look at this, you can think, Okay, for this particular um, image, they use 70 at 1. And in this one, they use 70 at 5. In this one, they use 70 at 25. And in this one, they use 70 at 50. So you can see that the, ma the mass is being updated, upped, you know, from 70 at 5 being optimal, considered optimal for this particular part based on this part's thickness versus 5 times more looks nearly identical. And then we do start to see some saturation, but that's 10 times overexposed, you know, so visually you may not be able to readily identify those types of things. So we have to be careful. Um, we have to be uh, cognizant of what we're actually uh, exposing our patients uh, to, how much we're exposing our patients to, and really just wor working with that radiologist to say, hey, is this 70 at one really acceptable? Should that be my baseline technique now?
Um, or perhaps that when you really zoom in, there's too much model on that. And really this is the optimal. But without those conversations, working with a radiologist hand in hand, you're not gonna be able to um, be able to make those evaluations. So like I said before, you have to have that bottom cutoff for each thickness, uh, for, that th for a respective thickness, and then uh, to be able to work then forward beyond that. So that way you're, um, you know, not overexposing it, but then manipulating it based on, you know, if thickness increases, of course, we manipulate our, our technique there accordingly. This picture just reiterates the idea that while visually this may look good on the radiologist monitor, it may not, especially once they zoom in and they really start to look at the uh, bony details, it may have a model type of appearance. So just kind of keep that in mind. You know, what we see may look okay, but on the radiologist screen, you know, something may be, you know, just yeah, too little exposure or modeled in its appearance. So two important terms that I really want you to be able to differentiate between. These terms are going to uh, come back to you over and over and over again. So I really want you to understand the differences between these two terms. So dynamic range is the range of exposures that may be captured by an, a respective imaging detector. So and that's, that's anything from what would be classically considered underexposed, optimally exposed, overexposed, to grossly overexposed. You know, what can the system... Uh, what information can the system take and still produce a radiograph that is going to be useful and uh, allow the radiologist to make a diagnostic decision from? So we know that there's a wide dynamic range with digital imaging. Exposure latitude is a different term and, and it has to do with the range of exposure that's going to produce a quality image at an appropriate patient dose. So. How can the radiologist make, make their decision at a dose that is most appropriate for that patient? So when we think about that, that means that little E sub zero, that optimal level um, on those um, graphs, those original graphs. So here is that visual. So here is that optimal level. And that's where we want to be able to plot our histogram. That's that exposure that would be considered to be optimal. Um, so not too little with, with model, not way too much with gross overexposure, but right, right there um, would be considered our exposure latitude. And then to further break down those terms, this whole line, this whole area would be considered to be our dynamic range of this particular detector system. Hopefully at this point you have a sound understanding of some of the basic ideas that are associated with um, the differences between screen film radiography and, film, uh, and digital radiography, including that of CR and DR, and can kind of say, okay, I get that there's differences in visual appearances and there is a need to evaluate exposure indicators. In part two of this lecture, we'll start to break down some of those exposure indicator systems.